Okay, so uh, it's nine o'clock. Let's get started. Uh, good morning, everybody. I'm Avi Goldfarb. I'm a professor of marketing at the Rotman School of Management, and I hold the Rotman Chair in Artificial Intelligence and Healthcare. Uh, welcome to our panel this morning. We're going to talk about uh, the data sets that are getting us through COVID and the story of the different factors that come together to create, maintain, and improve them. We're going to explore the needs, the challenges, and some lessons learned. We'll be comparing experiences on both sides of the border. Uh, two of our panelists are from Ontario, and we'll discuss the science table, the science advisory table, and two are from Minnesota, and they're going to share their experience with the COVID-19 hospital tracking project. So I'm going to briefly introduce our panelists, and then we're going to get started. From Ontario, uh, our first speaker is going to be Stanley Brown, who's the Dean of the Dalana School of Public Health, the University of Toronto, and the co-chair of the Ontario Science Advisory Table. Also from Ontario, we have uh, Dr. Laura Rosella, who's an epidemiologist, public health expert, and science director for the Population Health Analytics Lab. She's an associate professor in the Dalana School of Public Health at the University of Toronto, uh, where she holds Canada Research Chair in Population Health Analytics and is the PhD Epidemiology uh, Program Director. From Minnesota, we have Professor Pinar uh, Karakamandik. She is the C. Arthur Williams Jr. Professor of Healthcare Risk Management and the founding director of the Business Advancement Center for Health. Uh, at the Carlson School of Management at the University of Minnesota. And we have Fred Trotter, who is a healthcare data journalist and author, uh, founder of CareSet Systems and the Doc Graph Journal, a tech blog, tech, a technical blogger uh, for O'Reilly Radar, and co-author of the first health IT O'Reilly book, Hacking Healthcare. Today's session is the fourth of five in our seminar series, Learning from COVID-19, Leadership from the Private Sector. And each event in the series explores lessons from our experience with COVID related to the role of management, specifically collaboration and integration, business, and the private sector generally. This seminar series is one of many events put on uh, by the Center Rotman Center for Health Sector Strategy here at Rotman. And the center has three main areas of focus. First, research and thought leadership. Second, educational training for emerging and senior leaders in healthcare management. And third, outreach events like this one to encourage dialogue and learning on topics related to management and healthcare delivery. Now it's time for our event. We're gonna start off with opening remarks from each panelist, followed by questions from me and from you in the audience. Uh, if there's a question, please put it in the chat and we'll do our best to answer it. For now, I'd like to kick off our discussion by inviting Staney and Laura to present. Go ahead. Uh, yeah. All of us, I think, miss Will Mitchell very much, and uh, I wish that he was with us uh, here today. Uh, now, maybe uh, we can go to the uh, first slide, and I, I just want to put a little bit of context about what happened uh, in Ontario, and I think happened in public health systems in, in many parts of the world. We sort of hit this pandemic uh, as we were sort of cresting probably about almost a decade of decline in a lot of our public health systems. Uh, we struggled to have a true pan-Canadian information system. Uh, some of the interesting ways that we've been trying to track pandemics and, and learn how to respond to all of this, uh, like the Global Public Health Information Network, had been started to be downsized. Uh, we've seen the general scientific capacity in a lot of our, uh, our public sort of agencies and organizations shrink over time. Uh, and so really, we kind of got here at, at the worst possible time, a time when we probably needed more science, we needed more data, uh, we had less of it. And I think important to note as well, we went into this with relatively little data integration and where there's been always this kind of constant challenge about how do you sort of uh, measure control or, or progress against controlling the, uh, the virus and the pandemic. There's the other side of how you also understand the impacts across society as a whole. And really understanding that, understanding equity requires much stronger data systems that uh, overall that allow us to kind of understand public health, healthcare, uh, and, uh, and also sort of the social uh, determinants of health side of it. Uh, you can see here uh, quotes out of uh, different uh, newspapers, quotes out of different reports. I don't think there's any surprise here, but it is important to note that we were, as the, as the title says, they're dangerously thin uh, when we hit this pandemic. Uh, we can go to the next slide, please. So you know, I think in many ways, this explains why you saw so many different groups kind of come together and try to create the information to fill that gap or fill that void science table, but I think it's really important to kind of note a lot of the different activities here that were, again, really mostly volunteer activities driven by folks trying to make sure that information either got to people, uh, that it got to the health system or got out to the public in different ways, 
Uh, you can see a little bit here for the vaccine hunters who got to be, I think, the uh, hero uh, cover story heroes uh, of the pandemic in Toronto life this year. Uh, I want to pay particular attention or particular uh, praise to How's My Flattening, which was this very dynamic group that came together and all of a sudden became really the, the sort of go-to uh, place for uh, finding out how we were uh, progressing against the pandemic when we didn't have that type of tracking publicly available. Uh, the uh, group of scientists with my work, which is almost probably close to 100 scientists on a volunteer basis now across the province, again, really came together in very sort of, uh, you know, quickly, very light sort of ways of working through this. Um, maybe we can go to the, the next one, please. And I, I want to talk a little bit uh, here um, about both a few of the principles, but also uh, how these sort of got translated through. Uh, because this was a, a volunteer effort, because it relied heavily on uh, people working in universities, people working in hospitals, uh, people working in research institutes, really people for whom uh, this was an additional task, uh, sort of fed off of their work, but not kind of their core job. We kept the rules very, very light, and we really tried as much as possible uh, within the resources and, and context that we had to stress the principles that are core to any kind of scholarly activity around uh, independence. Uh, you watch any of the efforts, you'll see that people were constantly both participating, but also talking about what they felt. Uh, they never sort of assigned on anything they didn't agree with. Uh, and you know, in many ways, we're, we're quite critical or quite positive of different activities uh, both going on uh, in those sorts of uh, science tables or how's my flattening or other activities, but also uh, of government or uh, on one side or the other. Uh, but you also saw that there was a lot of work on transparency, which I think is, uh, is critical. And this evolved over time. And as you can see in this uh, uh, slide here, it evolved over time from you know, simple sort of tallies to much more sophisticated analytics over time with you know, both uh, the how's my flattening and you know, the science table dashboard that we now kind of try to update on almost a daily basis, uh, really driving a, um, a, a fair bit of activity here. Um, I also want to kind of note that you know, I think sometimes we, we criticize or we worry about the ability to get things done in our system uh, because of privacy and other rules. Uh, there was a lot of work actually to get around some of the bureaucracy, uh, both you know, by scientists, but by public servants as well, trying to get information out and trying to get data out. And I'd you know, point to the fact that uh, in relatively short order, we've been able to uh, stand up a, a wastewater data system in the province that helps us track the virus. Uh, this has happened remarkably quickly at the beginning and was a real, uh, very strong collaboration. Uh, I'll note that it's evolved to the point that uh, people like Doug Manuel, who's part of our uh, science advisory table, is now working with the World Bank on waterborne epidemiology projects around the world. Uh, you can see a variety of the ways of tracking here. And really, you know, uh, Laura's uh, on the call, so point out she's one of the first people to kind of try to get the uh, inequity lens very clearly focused and provide data on that. And that was all about trying to cobble all these things together. But, you know, again, I think we're happy to, you know, I think it's important to note this was driven by data that was shared uh, by government to try to get this out and get uh, some of the modeling underway. Uh, maybe we can go to the next slide, and I'll just sort of stop here. Uh, you know, this looks uh, very official, looks very serious. I don't ever want to kind of overemphasize the uh, structure or anything else that goes behind things like, for instance, the science advisory table. Uh, it's, it's really a confection. It's held together with a few principles of independence and transparency. Uh, it's almost entirely volunteer, uh, and it, I think, is able to maintain uh, some of the credibility it's been able to maintain uh, because of those principles and because of the fact that it does try to uh, reflect the process in a pandemic like this, that science really is a process. Uh, it's not a, a final result. And I think that's uh, been one of the things that's really helped kind of sustain it over time. Um, Laura, maybe I'll turn over to you at this point. Great. Thank you so much, Stanley. And I just want to pick up on that uh, in our experience, just draw out a few more details on how that process from, you know, very crude data to the beginning to, uh, you know, a lot of collaborative efforts to make data available to people that can make sense of it in really important ways for policy decisions. So this is a, an example from April 2021. And I'm, I'm, um, sharing this uh, from the modeling consensus table. So this is co-chaired by two uh, fantastic modelers in our, our midst from uh, Toronto and also from uh, McMaster. Uh, and they represent a group of modelers. So 
well, after that data sharing was enabled through a lot of hard work, it sounds like we had tables, then we had data and it was just sort of one step after the other. Certainly was not that smooth. There was a lot of effort in making that data available. But once it was available daily on a detailed and granular level that enabled the type of modeling that you see here, it became critical to inform the policy decisions that were made. And uh, we've seen a lot of these briefings. In fact, we've seen uh, Professor Brown give a lot of these briefings publicly, which was um, very much appreciated. But these models and, and these data really enabled very specific policy decisions uh, that were able to be proactive versus uh, reactive. And uh, I wanna emphasize one point that I think is missed sometimes when people look at these models from a cursory point of view. This is not one model. These are, uh, this is a table that brings together consensus from various models, which of course we know is much stronger from a scientific point of view. It's not just one modeler or one team or even one lab. It's five or six, all generating estimates independently and coming together to make a consensus that's the most meaningful. So these were the types of advancements once we had the data that really made a difference in terms of the policy decisions and getting really detailed, not just for mitigation strategies for um, public health measures, but also planning, uh, hospital capacity, et cetera. Another example I just want to draw, uh, and this was work generated by ICS also fed into the science table, was this uh, idea of really having a focus on equity. And we have lots of um, different exhibits and, and data that we worked on from this point of view, but this one specifically I want to just present because uh, it was focused on vaccines and we had a finally a very safe, effective, strong tool to mitigate the burden of COVID disease in the population. But initially, very uh, initially when it was rolled out, it, uh, so these analysis showed us that it wasn't being rolled out in an equitable way. And in fact, those that were at highest risk weren't necessarily seeing the highest vaccine coverage rate. And this was just step one. Step two was a range of responses, in particular community driven responses that drew attention to this issue and set up uh, appropriate vaccine clinics and opened up access and really spoke to their community and totally changed this. So within uh, a couple months, this grid looked very different. In fact, we were seeing those at highest risk, uh, their vaccine rates go up quite a bit. And it really changed the focus, the energy and the policy response. So just demonstrating how powerful the data was. And I'll just end, uh, these are again, a couple more uh, exhibits from the science table dashboard. Uh, and I wanted to just draw attention to the range of metrics, not that everyone's expected to go in each, but now this is being maintained on a regular basis by that group that Staney mentioned. Um, and moving into all types of data sources, we heard about wastewater data, also looking at things like mobility data, really broadening what we mean by data to inform decision making during a pandemic, um, understanding what measures were in place, what impact they were having on mo mobility became one of the critical aspects of informing policy decisions, um, as well as understanding who truly benefits from certain measures in terms of some people still have to go to work and are they protected and what other ways can we um, under, understand their risk and ensure appropriate measures are in place. So I'll stop there and uh, just want to add one or two more points on how data is used for decision making before we pass it over to our colleagues. Um, I'll, I'll start and then pass it back to Staney for final words. I think we've shared a lot on the importance of data, on looking at different types of data, emerging data, and really rallying the expertise around that data to make sense of it in the most robust way. What we haven't talked about, which hopefully will come out in the discussion, is how that data is used for decision making, which is a much more complex, messy process um, in that uh, data it feeds into the decision making process, but the decision making process involves many other things. And I want to acknowledge that through all of this, what we've learned is the importance of transparency. So the data may lead to a decision which as a scientist feel uh, is, there's an obvious decision and then another decision might be taking, taken. And the principles of ensuring that the data is available to all and the transparency on why that decision is being made despite the data or maybe because of the data becomes one of the critical aspects uh, that I think we need to reinforce and, and find better ways to ensure that we're being transparent about. So Stane, I'll pass to you to final, for final words.
Yeah, maybe just to build off a, off a couple of points that you raised. You know, the first is the transparency is the critical bit here. Uh, I, I think sometimes we want uh, to hear that you know the science is being followed, the data is driving all those decisions, and uh, that may be what uh, you want to see as a scientist. It may be what you want to see if you got a particular view on it. But at the end of the day, the data and the science don't make the decisions. It has to be made through a much messier process. But you can make that a much better process, I think, by driving as much information out as clearly as you can. And that's that's not just websites. It's making sure it's well communicated. It's participating in sort of the broader sphere. And so it really does, you know, and I expect we'll hear this really profoundly from our colleagues south of the board. It's really about breaking down the walls of the academy in a way that uh, leads to a bit of exchange. And, you know, I think Laura uh, put up some of the data in, uh, around uh, inequity. And sometimes we were following what communities were already telling us and just bring the data to the table to show what was happening in a, in a sort of pan provincial way. Sometimes we were finding new things. And so it's really important to kind of get that uh, that wall between the academy and the community broken down. So the data is out there and there's a flow of information both ways. Um, the other thing I'd say just finally is that, you know, my colleague Yasmin Khan has done a lot of work thinking through what preparedness for these sorts of health emergencies really looks like. And a critical part of it is having these data systems. Uh, the challenge is when everything's working out well, it's an easy thing not to pay attention to. It's an easy thing to forget about, or when you're under any type of fiscal pressure, it's an easy thing to cut. And I think one of the challenges we'll have over the next decade is, uh, as we recover from this pandemic is making sure that the uh, both kind of the intellectual capital and the movements forward that we've had on data sharing and data transparency somehow don't fall to the side, uh, that we're able to maintain and actually build on them over the next little while. And, uh, hopefully that'll not require another pandemic to reinforce the importance of it. Thanks. I'll, I'll turn it over right back to you, Armin. Okay, great. Thanks, Danny. Thanks, Laura. Uh, now we're going to pass it on to Fred and Pinar to talk about uh, their experience on, you know, south of the border. Um, uh, thank you. I think I'm going first. Um, and um, well, let me just quickly give the background of um, how I met Pinar, I guess that's the right story to tell. Um, so um, my background is that I'm a healthcare data journalist. Now I have uh, worked in, in emergency response for a long time during Hurricane Ike in Houston. I'm actually not from Michigan, I'm from Texas. Uh, so I live in Houston and, and during uh, Hurricane Ike, I was the, um, uh, the chief architect of our health information exchange. So I'm, I'm, I've had some experience in, in kind of moving healthcare data around during emergencies. Uh, but now what I do is usually work at work with uh, claims data. So we, we at CareSet, my company has access to uh, Medicare claims data um, through a new program that the government recently launched. And so we've, we've we're frankly have 150% um, of what we have the capacity to do in terms of analyzing that data for, for, uh, for healthcare issues, you know, kind of the day before the pandemic started. When the pandemic started, um, the uh, the federal government in the United States didn't really have a daily picture of anything, um, any kind of healthcare issue that was coming in and getting uh, uh, the kind of information that they needed from hospitals, um, you know, kind of all the time. I think the CDC had a history of a, a kind of a philosophy of surveillance that was. Uh, I think much slower uh, academic, you know, interested in looking at patterns that were taking places over the courses of months using participants who were there voluntarily, uh, maybe only, for instance, tapping into the data systems uh, of large academic medical centers um, and, uh, and, and not kind of every hospital in the country. And in fact, one of the problems, uh, the first problems that had to be overcome, uh, which is still a problem, is that we don't actually have identifiers uniquely for every hospital facility in the country. And in fact, the data sets that we're going to be talking about in a second were the first time that, that, that every physical hospital building, as opposed to a hospital system or a pair of hospitals or partner hospitals, um, kind of got a, a unique ID. Um, so there was a huge push to build this infrastructure. And then a few months in, uh, there was a pretty substantial amount of criticism about decisions that were being made and representations that were being made based on this infrastructure that was really born basically overnight at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, and Amy Gleason, who, who I have known for years as a health IT professional, and Pinar will have her own story about how she kind of got in this little group, were invited into a little group where uh, the data team uh, at, at uh, HHS, CDC, and, and the White House, who were all cooperating to kind of build this emergency infrastructure, 
I wanted to start releasing data, but they needed a way to beta test this. And so our role was to take these data sets and to uh, you know kind of criticize them, ask questions about them, look for inconsistencies and consistencies and to get them out. And before we really talk too much about it, I just want to show them because it's um, it's one of the things that's uh, very difficult to talk about in the abstract and, uh, and, and really needs to be examined. So this is the uh, our frequently asked question. Are you seeing my screen? Does everybody see facility COVID puff community fact? It's hard to yes, tell. I can see it. Shown. Wonderful. So this is a frequently asked question that, that we put up on GitHub. You can still go there and ask questions. People still do. Um, you can create issues with the FAC, and, and we just treated it like an open source project. This is not endorsed by the government. It was part of what we as this little group did in order to support the release of these data sets. And there were two, arguably three, big data sets that were released. One is this uh, facility level um, uh, uh, puff, which is just a straight table showing um, what, what's happening. The next was, and that it, it looks like this. So uh, if you link to the data on healthdata.gov, you're just gonna see columns of data um, about uh, here's a particular hospital and here are the data coming in for about cases and deaths and ICU usage on these specific hospitals. Um, and, and they have a wonderful little browser here. So you can actually do some pretty sophisticated filtering of this data if you click, um, uh, if you search for the, COVID fact on GitHub, you'll find our resource. And if you go down here to the view data button after clicking to the data, you'll get this filterable table and you can look at things on a per hospital basis in the United States. I think that's really interesting. Here is the next one. And this actually, I think is an interesting question. I think is what I would kind of want to ask the group back is this, the, the COVID data has become highly politicized and has been uh, the whole time, but I almost see two layers of, of discussion happening. One is an academic discussion, and then there's a transparency discussion, a transparency discussion about whether or not there's adequate transparency in an academic and, and professional discussion amongst researchers and, 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 uh, and journalists about what, what is happening, what is the correct picture. And then there's the, the, the misinformation that's happening in the public, which denies in some cases that there's a pandemic at all. So it, it's, it, it's incredibly strange to me, and I don't see a connection, honestly, between the two. But one of the most controversial things that happened in the United States was that the governors of the states were getting these reports that were called the governor's reports. And a couple of these leaked to the press early in the pandemic and were giving really, really specific and solid information, the best picture that we, we as a country had to governors, but not to the public. And so in, in, a, in a very strange fashion, there became the political issue of whether or not Trump is releasing the governor's reports and it became like, are they transparent enough? And in response, this state of team said, well, we want to release the governor's thing, but now it's that that's now a political drama that's become politicized. And so instead they released this COVID community profile report, which had exactly the same content. Um, and I'm going to show it to you, but I think it's very interesting to think that this was, this is the picture that the governors were getting that the public was not, then the public got it. And the moment they got it, all the controversy and, and, and all this went away. It was, it, it was almost as ago. again, these two layers were not connected in any kind of meaningful way. So if we look at the community profile report, there's two components to it. One is a PDF report and the other is an Excel spreadsheet. But I'll show you both. Uh, this is the website to get the PDF. And so if you want to scroll down here, you'll see that there's a history of PDF and Excel files going all the way back. So you can actually track over time how things are changing. This is the PDF. Um, at the top of the PDF, again, it's a community profile report. This is from last week. Top of the report, you see the basic four data points that we have uh, that we're, we're, we're kind of working with overall on, on, on the pandemic as a whole. Here's new cases. And you can see the massive spike of Omicron here happening, dwarfing everything that's happened before from a case perspective. You have seen the hospital admissions following the same pattern. And of course, Thankfully, you see that new deaths are not the same as they were previously. So we, which is again, this, this is the story that we've been told. We also see that the massive spike of deaths happened um, uh, essentially last winter. Um, now, of course, uh, the uh, test positivity rate is the only thing that doesn't track with everything else because it's a percentage. And so at the beginning, there was very little testing. So I'd say somewhere around here, this became a kind of a valid and comparable data set. Uh, the early days of the testing is not something you can compare. And testing in general is so complicated because there's two factors that make this go up and down. One is the amount of testing you're doing, and then there's the percentage of it that is positive. And so you have to account for both of those things as you read this particular chart. And then if you scroll down more, I, I will skip over the detail here, but 
Uh, this is case incidents of the last seven days, comparison to, uh, to seven days. You can actually see here how the recent spike is essentially washing out the data structure and data visualization they have here. They This darkest red, 750 or more, they don't have any more shades to go. We've gone so deep that essentially the whole country is in this dark red, which is a, a, you know, a terrifying picture. This is the kind of place where these geoanalysis things become a little more reasonable, where you can actually see some parts of the country doing well, other parts of the country not doing well. Uh, but, uh, but again, this is, there's beautiful, beautiful maps in here. Uh, just real quickly, here's the Excel version, uh, which is giving you some of the same data, but broken up on a per state basis and a per, um, uh, uh, this is the state view, I'm sorry, this is the city view, and then you can see the state view, same information. And if I scroll the top here, you see that there's cases, uh, cases and deaths that change. So you can see whether or not things are getting better or getting worse, which is something that has been noted as being particularly helpful to, to uh, people who are making decisions with this data. Um, and again, this is fascinating data. It's fascinating to get a picture of what, uh, what is happening uh, right now. For my part, I'm trying to figure out and understand why I think the controversies that we talk about when we're trying to get our arms around these data are not actually the same controversies that are going around the, um, uh, the public health sphere. Like, I don't understand how we got to a place where whether or not you get vaccinated became a political, uh, uh, political topic. I think that's fascinating. I think, frankly, it has more to do with whether or not Putin wants to invade the Ukraine than it does with any kind of efforts that the CDC has. Um, given the evidence that that the misinformation campaigns are are, are sourced from Russia, um, and and we, I uh, spent some time thinking about cybersecurity, and I was on a task force about cybersecurity, and one of the nightmare scenarios was that we would have a pandemic, and at the same time we had a cyber an information warfare uh, uh, attack, and that's essentially what happens. We have two problems, not one. One is we have the misinformation issue, and then we have the pandemic happening at the same time, and they're cross pollinating. Um, so I have more questions than I have answers. I hope there's some good data and I'm more than happy to hand it over to Penal. Yeah, thank, thank you, Fred. Um, I'll, I'll, if you, I'll share now. Yeah, so Fred and I started working in this, um, what we call like an informal working group um, a while back, um, I guess summer of 2020, <laughs> um, when uh, his group and other data journalists and us as academics, we were, all trying to get some sort of data from you know, the federal government and analyze and, and at the same time also you know, reconcile some of the data that we were collecting. So I don't know if you noticed, but one of the, the plots that Fred showed was about hospitalizations and it starts, the federal data, it starts at August 1 of 2020 with a gray to the left back to the beginning of the pandemic saying uh, they can't report because they're, 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 there was insufficient reporting. But another effort that was going on in the United States was each State Department of Health um, was, had started to put on some information about the cases and the deaths. But still, when we go back to March 2020, uh, public health officials in every state, they were really scrambling uh, for data to help predict. For the prep to prepare for the surge of the hospitalizations due to COVID-19. And so that's where our team comes in. The moment that we realized that there was really little data out there on hospitalizations and it was not in uniform in any case, but then when we think about it, um, there were important issues with the case data because they were underreported. Uh, if you remember back to those days, back in March, 2020, there was not wide scale testing only the symptomatic people were getting tested. So just by using the cases and the tests, we had no way of understanding the prevalence of the pandemic, especially when we had very little information about how it's evolving. And similar deaths, of course, that's a very objective measure, but they are, deaths are such lagging indicators that we wanted to set, figure out a way to sort of meet in the middle ground. So we figured that tracking hospitalizations was going to be a major step forward in quantifying the impact of the on the hospital systems, forecasting utilization and disease severity, yet it did not exist in any, any systematic way. It was just sort of like, literally I put over a week and I put my uh, two teenagers at home to do a Google doc on different states and the newspapers that different states were publishing and any state health website that they could go to see if there were any hospitalization data and uh, 
So when we started, maybe there were like a handful, 10 or 15 states that were reporting something. We put our project together over a weekend and uh, started really collecting data for two weeks. And then we made a call to look even with the two weeks of data, you can really, really understand what is going on. So I'm gonna share my screen. Um, um, can you see our project um, page? Yeah. So yeah, so um, this is a snapshot uh, of our project uh, website. I'm not gonna go through the interaction, interactions. It's a very interactive website, but this uh, is, uh, as you can see, that's January 1 of 2021. That was a snapshot then when we thought we had reached the peak and that things were going to most likely get better um, after that. Um, you know, but of course, uh, that's sort of where we are uh, a couple of days ago, about a week ago where we are seeing our second major peak um, due to Omicron. Unfortunately, um, the, the website is kind of nicely done in a way that you know, while you can see these aggregate pictures, you can also really go into in depth here uh, in one of these tabs. We can look at, we can do a deep dive analysis of the current hospitalizations. Um, we could look at ICU. Now we have this ventilator data that the federal government is not really reporting, but we've been collecting from day one as much as we could, where you can kind of click on the ventilator. Not every state is reporting, but whatever we can get, we actually report it there. Um, so it's been a very challenging project where, you know, we start on March 2020, we released this website on April of 2020. Um, I can't believe in a few months, we'll be two years into this project. Of course, we had no idea what we were getting into, how long the pandemic would um, go. And, um, and you know, we are a small academic group here where we're trying to fill a gap. You know, when we're, as academics, when we do our projects, we tend to sort of say, okay, this is our next two year project line with a project. No, we had no way of doing it. Yet we had to promise to the public that we are gonna keep doing it as much as we had to. There were many times where we thought maybe it's almost the end. And of course it was not the end. Um, um, what Fred is referring to is in December of 2020, federal government started releasing data at the facility level. But again, we and Fred's group, we've been working with the federal government much before that, sort of sharing what we are seeing from the states and what they're reporting from the hospital uh, since that summer of 2020 and really reconciling differences, reconciling definition differences, reconciling reporting, and really trying to make that data that the federal government is releasing to the public uh, improve in its quality. And it, we feel very you know, honored to participate in that process. And we feel that we really contributed positively. But so basically then when the federal government came to us and said, okay, you guys have been asking for these data at the hospital level, you're going to release it, but you have to vet it for us. So that's when we really teamed up and worked really hard on the data, asked the government clarifying questions, showed some discrepancies in the data, asked for additional data fields to be added to the public data that they were going to release. Um, and very cool is like Fred and his team and other projects like the COVID tracking projects, COVID app now, several other groups that were working with us at the time, they were looking at it a lot more from what does the public want to see? What does a journalist want to see when they look at this data? And our team was looking at it much more from the eye of a researcher or a public health uh, expert or you know, a business person who's just trying to understand this data and maybe a hospital administrator, you know, kind of trying to figure out what are the data gaps and what, how will they look at this data? And that's why it was the first time I participated while we were analyzing this data and releasing these dashboards we also found ourselves, you know, writing what uh, Fred labeled community FAQs. Like, so these were FAQs that we said, this is the data that the government is releasing. Here's what to know about it. Here are the things you can link it to. Here are the questions you can answer. Here are the questions you cannot get at and all that kind of cool stuff. So anyways, our project has really taken a, 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 another level since that facility level data became available as we basically, take that data and analyze it every week, create our maps and we create um, um, week to week changes. We create like key insights documents that we share with the journalists. We feed data to NPR, uh, our national public radio every week and that they use it, uh, this data to create their own maps with it. 
Um, but I, of course, being an academic group, we also, you know, worked a lot to uh, publish with these data as we collected it. <laughs> we kept working with other teams at other universities, Indiana University, Washington University, and uh, University of Southern California, just analyzing the data we were collecting in real time, which is something else that I, as an academic, have never participated. You know, usually you have the data collected and you work with it, or you do a data collection, a primary data collection, there's a phase, and then you, you work and analyze it. This was like real time, data changing, literally from one publication submission to the revision, we would update the whole paper because we would have like had two weeks or three weeks of new data coming in. So we, you know, um, uh, published uh, on just looking even with the smallest few observations we had, we looked at uh, with the data we could, but in this case, it was limited to four states where we could comfortably look at some trends, what the stay at home order uh, um, uh, mandates were doing to the states, what um, you know, what the trajectory would have been had we not had a stay at home uh, order, which is this orange sort of a bar, whereas what we saw as the effectiveness, uh, the, the actually observed line as a result of the associated with the stay at home order. Uh, we were the first team uh, in the US to be able to look at uh, racial and ethnic disparities and hospitalizations because our approach to this data was from the day one, we're gonna collect everything we can. We're gonna gather everything we can related to hospitalizations. Uh, we have a small team. We can't get all the data in the cases, et cetera, but hospitalizations will pick up everything we can. So the moment states started releasing data on you know, race and ethnicity, breakdown of the hospitalizations, we kept gathering it. So at some point, uh, this was I think August, we were able to uh, pr publish this paper at which point we had data only from 12 states, and that hasn't really improved, unfortunately, in terms of race, ethnicity, reporting, and hospitalization data. Maybe some more states joined the team, but not many more. We were, we saw we had huge discrepancies in the sense that the state's uh, breakdown of um, hospitalizations uh, fell much larger on the minority populations relative to, you know, the, the minority population's representation in the state. Um, population. Again, with the same theme, the moment states started reporting any data on pediatric by age breakdown, we were able to collect these age breakdowns. We were, again, one of the first teams in the, 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 the country to be able to actually look at pediatric trends in hospitalizations. Um, uh, we also looked at other policy decisions like the um, uh, reopening of the economies where we thought, okay, we we can look at stay-at-home orders, but then there is a whole reopening, which is not necessarily the mirror image uh, reversed. So we were able to actually look at the, the reopenings and kind of look at the, the trends associated with, you know, um, hospitalizations. Um, all the award projects, some from the business community, uh, some from educational uh, organizations like um, the Business School Education Accreditation uh, Organization worldwide, as well as we were one of the finalists for the NIHCM Digital Media Award. And most recently we won, or we won the INFORMS uh, Design Science Award for the design of the dashboard. And this is our team. Again, it's not a huge team, uh, largely volunteer effort. Um, where we have a fantastic team of graduate and undergraduate students uh, who are with us. And really, really interesting team as like this team has been pivoting all the time while trying to stay to a standard methodology. That has been our challenge. And we're still going. I'm hoping not to do much more, but uh, of the data collection, but we're going to uh, keep on doing as, which is as long as we have to. Thank you. Okay, thanks, uh, Fred, Pinar, Staney, Laura. Um, my first question is going to be back to Fred and Pinar, but it's going to be on the theme that Laura and Staney ended with, which is you've built this incredible data set. Um, do you have a sense of how and whether it influenced decisions? And are you comfortable with that, you know, with the decisions that ended up coming out of the data set that you built? So I'll... Uh, maybe pin our first and then Fred. Yeah, sure. I mean, it's it's never, um, you know, as an academic, 
data is never enough. We always wish we have more data, but, but I think that the, the data that we collected and some of these studies that were really released have really um, made an impact in, and contributed to that growing evidence that was maybe largely based on cases like, for example, the racial and ethnic disparities question, right? There was, we were hearing it from the cases coming in um, that um, the, the minority populations, primarily Black um, and African-American and Hispanic populations are disproportionately impacted uh, burdened by the pandemic. And, you know, like our evidence was kind of take it the next step and say like, yeah, you can see it throughout the entire chain. Like now you're seeing it in hospitalizations as well. Some of that was, in, I think, in, like I caught the attention of policymakers that way. Um, another sort of a really humble and maybe in a way that I was not surprised, it's not necessarily impacting like decision-making, uh, like this particular example uh, on the global scale, but like, we have, I can't tell you how many emails we get just from the regular public, on, especially when the, the HHS started releasing these data, especially when we were at the very peak, the very first peak, as to like, how is my hospital doing? <laughs> like, how, if I need to go to the hospital today, where do I go? And, 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 and believe it or not, we have been receiving questions like that, and we've been looking at the HHS data, trying to direct them, and that's one of the tools, like, as I mentioned, we get the HHS data, we process it in a uh, real understandable way, and, and we share with NPR, and then they basically, that's, and that's how it makes it to the public to answer that question primarily. Um, okay. Great. Okay, thank, thanks, Pinar. Uh, Fred, do you have anything to add to that? Um, well, I have to kind of pull back on some credit here. I didn't actually gather any data. Pinar actually did. Um, I... <laughs> spent most of my time trying to figure out what the data was saying. Um, so th there's this fascinating effect where essentially there was a disconnect at the political level between what Trump was willing to say and what his healthcare professionals were willing to say. Um, and I, I have to recommend at this point, uh, World War C by Sanjay Gupta has extensive interviewing with almost all of the physicians that were an, an, an epidemiologist who were really central in leading the pandemic response. But one of the things that Dr. Uh, Burks did, uh, who was the scarf lady, you know, you saw her on television, she has lovely scarves, and, is that she essentially went on a travel tour to go to by state by state to go and convince uh, governors and mayors to implement local policies that made sense. And I think this is one of the differences, I think, between discussing uh, the city environment that I think is the focus for our Canadian colleagues and the national perspective that we have is that this, this data pack essentially about here's what's happening and here's what you need to do in your schools in order to do this. Um, that was not something that, at least during the Trump administration, happened at, at the podium coming from the national level. Instead, it was someone going out in, and, and taking these community profile reports and other things that gave these pictures and saying, here's what you need to do. Um, I, I think that story um, is, is fascinating. And again, I do recommend, I think the best coverage I've seen of it is in the World War C book, which I recommend very much. Um, it was excellent. I learned a lot and I was as close as a journalist can be, I think, to at least the data part of it. Um, and and I, I still learned a bunch about what happened. But I definitely think that there is this mesh between how the decisions are being made, which I think is still broken, uh, but now broken in different ways under the Biden administration, and what the data teams are picking up, and, and our ability, at least as a nation, to, to ingest and translate between the city level, state level, and country level decision making uh, that, that, uh, that makes sense. Uh, but the only thing I'm sure about uh, on this issue is that I didn't gather any data. So I, I just wanted to highlight that real, uh, real quick, that I'm sure about. Okay. Uh Thanks, Fred. Now I'm going to turn to, um, I think this next question will be best for Staney, but Laura, uh, maybe it's it's a little bit for you too, which is talking about um, providing data and making decisions based on the data. Um, there's two aspects of the data that I saw in those presentations. There is the data. This is the number of hospitals. This is the number of cases to the extent we have it. And then there's predictions, projections about what's going to happen over the next four weeks if we do this, if we do that. The data is much closer to ground truth than the predictions. How, when you communicate, especially when you communicate to policymakers, do you distinguish between, hey, this is what's happening right now, and this is our best guess, which has an error, 
in how things are going to play out. So part one, and then part two is how do you think, you know, is that distinction um, you know, used in some way for or against what you might call uh, the science uh, when politicians or others are making decisions? So Stanley, I'll go to you first and Laura, you can add. Yeah, sure. So, you know, this is the, this is the hardest thing to do, right, is to communicate uncertainty. And yeah, I started my career off in the private sector and, and my first boss always used to look at me and say, you know, I want a one-handed academic, and, you know, don't <laughs> stay on the one hand and on the other hand. Uh, and so, yeah, I, I think there's this incredible pressure to communicate certainty that can be really seductive and really tempting. And I think the challenge is to try your best to say, this is what we know, and this is, uh, you know, the range of, of the predictions, which sometimes are really, really, really large, right? Um, I think the only thing that a scientist can do in this sort of a case is, is really sort of um, a couple, three things that are important. The first is, and I'm really indebted to my colleague, Carolyn Tui, for helping me think about a lot of these issues and, and kind of educating me on what's going around the world, but you have to keep some space between the science and the decision makers, right? Uh, whether you think the decision's right or wrong, um, you didn't run for office. And so we try to create as much information as we can. We try to put in the form, again, a, a term that Carolyn Tui's introduced me to, a serviceable truth that's fast enough and it's clear enough that it can be a basis for decision making. Um, but you, you got to keep that space. Uh, I think the second thing is you need to be transparent about everything. I think what would be really problematic if we were giving one piece of advice over here and releasing something else publicly. And this is where I think, uh, you know, some of the initiatives we're hearing about uh, from our colleagues south of the border are great because they're stressing the transparency, but it's also where we saw some stuff fall apart in the United Kingdom, for instance, where you had incredibly smart people, but it wasn't clear what was being said publicly and what was being said privately and, and who was saying it. And we've tried to stress that as we've gone along. And, you know, to the point that we've even got a full declaration of conflicts of interest for all of our people who participate in this, which is something that we don't see uh, here very often in that sort of a public way. Um, I think the, the third thing that you really kind of have to do is uh, recognize that, you know, Avi, it's nice you said there's the ground truth of the data. That's not even accepted fully, right? <laughs> okay, fair enough. And, and I get uh, a very interesting set of correspondence almost on a daily basis. Sometimes it's positive, sometimes it's negative. Sometimes it very much is based on what the data says, and sometimes it's just questioning the whole set of data itself. Uh, and it's uh, it's really been interesting that I think it's, constantly trying to communicate uh, in a transparent way so it can be validated, but also kind of constantly communicating against what's really an infodemic in some ways. Uh, and you have to kind of persist in that and just constantly be kind of reframing according to your best principles uh, scientifically, not trying to kind of respond to everything. So I think it's, you know, there's only a few things that scientists can do here. No, that's, that's really helpful. Um, and <clears throat> Laura, I'm going to have something of a follow-up question for you, and then we're going to go uh, back to Fred and Pinar. So the, which is, there's lots of different, lots of people did what, uh, you know, Fred did and Pinar did and, and you did and I did early in the pandemic and tried to create data that would be useful. Um, a lot of that data never got used and maybe it was totally useless. Like I remember, you know, I worked on a, a, a project for much of March through, you know, I guess you were a little part of it, right? Much of March through September of 2020. And in some sense, the data was never used. And I imagine there's you know, hundreds, if not thousands of other people in the same situation. So how do we, how do you figure out what to focus on when there's so many opportunities? And um, you know, what, in your view, ended up being you know, the hallmarks of useful data uh, in terms of decision-making versus not useful data? Because we have, the four of you are all you know, people who figured out how to create useful data. Yeah. Uh, there's a bunch of us who didn't. And so how do we make that decision, that distinction? Yeah, so I think the key part of this, and this is really hard as an academic, is and we have to listen. We have to listen to what the most important questions are, and we have to listen to where data will add the most value. We love to show beautiful graphs and analyses that reinforce what we already know that frankly aren't going to change a policy direction. But there are a lot of things if you sit and talk to decision makers and you listen, or there are people that do that in the in-between, um, that they will, be, they will tell you what the questions are. And you have to anchor on that. It's, this is something that's a challenge for academic because we have passion about particular areas and we have our own questions. We're scientists, we have our own curiosity. But this is about putting our talent to use for a question that needs answering. 
And if you start listening to the decision-making process and where they're struggling, and then you can see, well, actually this perspective on the data will actually help the infighting that's happening when the decisions are being made one way or another. So it really is about tuning out our own questions, all, not all the way, but maybe turning it down and tuning up to what are the questions that actually need answering. And that's difficult. We had a lot, um, and, and lots of people have good instincts on this, but uh, there's a lot of things that frankly surprise me, the most interesting data were some of our most simple analyses, some of our most simple descriptive analyses that showed nuance at a community level, those are the most useful because they can actually do something about that. They can say, you know what, actually that intersection or that community group, I can engage with them and do something. And if you didn't show me the data this way, I wouldn't have done that. So some of the most um, sort of just simple data actually made the biggest difference. I wanna say one thing on the prediction point, um, just because I can't resist as someone who does modeling myself, I think one of the big challenges, we have to ask why we do these models to begin with. And it's actually to help manage uncertainty. So they are not supposed to be, this is what's going to happen. They are supposed to be, give me the range of plausible scenarios so I can plan and be prepared for sometimes three or four of them, not one. Um, and once we have those parameters laid out, we can actually plan and be ready for it. And that's why we do models not necessarily to predict the future and follow one path, but actually to be prepared for multiple paths. To embrace uncertainty. I, I love that perspective. Uh, okay, so we're starting to get questions in from, from the audience. Uh, so uh, gonna, oh, and they're coming in fast and furious now. So, so keep those coming. Um, so summarizing a few of these questions, you know, this one's for Fred and Pinar. It, this is an incredible, what you guys, what you've done is this incredible example of government, academia, journalist, you know, citizen collaboration. We don't see that a lot. Um, and it seems like it's almost a management task to make that happen. Much more than a, you're like, hey, yeah, there's lots of people who are good at you know, creating spell spreadsheets and uh, figuring out how to put them on. And there's other people who are good at figuring out how to put them online. Somehow, the two of you and your team uh, you know, managed uh, what you know, you know, what the federal government wasn't doing ultimately. And so how did you, you, how do you, how did you sort of get those skills? How did you meet each other? And I guess the, the big question is um, <clears throat> when you, you know, started out two years ago to fill in this gap, um, you know, how did you layer on those pieces and how did you learn you were wrong on certain things and needed to sort of change direction? Yeah, so I mean, first then Fred. <laughs> it um, honestly, it came a little bit organically. Just um, it's the best way to describe it. I think uh, both Fred's team and then other teams that were sort of on the data collection and the journalism side of things, everyone was like really driven by the mission to get some information. Um, out there and like just to collect and share information and answer questions because everyone had so many questions. Um, and um, it's not like necessarily a skill set, but I think what Laura was saying as well, I think one thing that was super important for our collaboration was the idea that we had to listen to each other and, and really share in, in a safe space in these informal working groups, like share with each other what we were hearing from the public or from other research community, from other, maybe from our own Department of Health uh, state, you know, Department of Health sort of had with their questions. Everyone who was sort of closer to their own team is deciding it. But um, I would say another thing, like um, when the federal government started releasing some of the data in August of 2020, and we started comparing the data we were collecting, it was so rocky, like things were not matching, things were all over the place. And then uh, at that time, you know, I reached out to uh, another group, COVID Tracking Project. They had stopped their project uh, as of March of 2021, but they were active then. I said, well, do you see what we're seeing? Like, you know, one of my academic instincts will be, hey, I'm collecting our, uh, you know, my own data. 
the federal government is you know releasing some data it doesn't match i'm just going to write a blog post about it and put it out there like I would be lying if I would if I say that didn't cross my mind. That was one of the, the ideas that I had. But then instead, we were also driven with like we really need to understand what is not matching because you know the public deserves better information here. So you know that's sure. when I reached out to this other journalist colleague, um, Alexis Madrigal, and said, you know, and he's like, no, we're seeing what you're seeing. Like so, the two teams matched, and then and then. And he introduced us to uh, Amy Gleason, who was leading the federal government's team at that point, and Fred was already in that group. And then we started seeing like, and then it boiled down to things like, some of the states were not explicit about uh, when they say what a hospitalization is, whether it's sus you know, su suspected or confirmed. Some okay. states were combining them together somewhere, and there were data lags. Um, whereas the government was getting its data from the hospital directly, they were reporting a combined measure. So like that created some decision. No, the government should also split this up, split the suspected and the confirmed. Let's see as much as we can to the apples to apples Fantastic. of kind of comparisons. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Pinar. So I, we have time for like two more questions. So Fred, I'm going to start with you on Thomas's question. And then Staney, you're going to get the last word in response to Sheldon's question. Uh, so um, how do we think about data communication and science data communication to potentially overcome misinformation? So Fred, you're the, you're the data journalist on the call. So I don't know if you have some view of what you, you know, what's the way to get the message of what's in the data out? So um, I, I, you know, let me the first minute. I don't know the answer to that question. I think the problem is that no one knows the answer to that question. Um, I do think that, that there, we, we need a metaphor for how to discuss it. And I think um, I think the way right way to compare, I think the thinking at the CDC HHS and, and in general, the academic environments is that it's it's a an, an evolutionary process that has been operating very slowly. And if you look at social media, that's an evolutionary process where it, because there's billions to be made there, it, it's much, moving much, much faster. So you can think of kudzu in the American South, which has just taken over this vine that grows an invasive species. Uh, in general, the way it, uh, invasive species come in and just absolutely dominate a niche. Um, the, the communication capabilities of Facebook, Twitter, Reddit, and, and one thing that I think is extremely dangerous is, is thinking about these things under the, the, calling them all social media. Each one of these platforms has a set of rules by which they operate. And I don't think, uh, the people who work at the CDC who are trying to communicate information, who are trying to get things out, and, and I think any of us in academia understand in a really fluent way uh, how those platforms work and how much faster they proliferate information than uh, than uh, than what we are used to. And I think that the metaphor of kudzu, which just grows so much faster, um, is is eloquent there because if you, you you just have there's a pace. And the paces are off. There's a massive mismatch of the timing. Um, and I, I don't know how to solve that problem or exactly what to do, but I do think having a good metaphors for that is, is really, really helpful. Okay, thanks, Fred. Uh, Stanley, I'm gonna give you the last word. We have a question about uh, separation of you know, powers, I guess, of scientists and, and politicians. Um, and you know, the chief public health officers have expertise and they currently have legal powers. Um, so why do we say that these decisions should be political? Well, at, at the end of the day, I don't think it's a question they should be, they are, right? Uh, there are governments that appoint a chief public health officer and that person is a public servant. And you would not want to find a situation where the chief public health officer is saying one thing and government is overruling or doing another thing. And I think we saw a little bit of that south of the border. You can see the types of uh, confusion and challenge that breeds, right? And we've seen it in other jurisdictions where I think you have sort of a, a significant conflict that actually, um, you know, despite I think heroic efforts in some of these jurisdictions, you actually see it bringing down the overall ability to execute on on public health sort of measures. That being said, you know, I, I'll build off of you know I think Fred's really sort of thoughtful comments, right, and and some of the other questions. We do need to get much better at communicating the science because at the end of the day, you know, what's the old line? Public health only moves at the speed of trust. And so if we're able to communicate better, if we're able to understand the rules, of these different ways of communicating, I think we'll do, uh, we'll have a much better chance of getting good things over the line. I guess the other thing I'd say too, is that I think sometimes we look at it in a, in a very heroic way, right? Where we've had strength, it's because we've been able to cope with the uncertainty. 
one person communicating better doesn't cope with the uncertainty, nor does it give you the comprehensive picture you need to deal with a public health issue that touches so many different aspects of our lives. And so the better we get at uh, you know, developing the types of leaders in, in the scientific community or you know, in, in the uh, you know, building type scientific leaders in the journalistic community, like you know, Fred's talking about, um, the better we'll do in our response because we'll have a stronger platform uh, on which everyone can kind of make decisions. Okay, um, I love that public health uh, only moves at the speed of trust. That's that's a great way to to end this uh, conversation on data. So thanks, Danny. Uh, thank you, everyone. This was an incredibly informative and insightful discussion. Um, we are at ten sharp, so uh, unfortunately, our discussion has to end. Uh, please do join us again. Our final event in the series is on February tenth. Learning from COVID nineteen: Global Vaccine Development, Production, and Distribution. Uh, Registration is on the Rotman Events page, where you found this event. Wishing everybody a great day ahead. Thanks very much and take care. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye.